Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's installment of our Lunch Bites series, the first of calendar year 2022. We're so grateful that so many of you have taken time out of your day to join us as we begin a series that Jane will talk about in just a couple of minutes, uh, exploring the important life and legacy of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune uh, in advance of her arrival in National Statuary Hall. Before we get into all that, my name is Samuel Holliday. I have the tremendous privilege of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship for the United States Capitol Historical Society. Uh, throughout today's program, I will be in the background uh, facilitating any technical or uh, any technical troubleshooting. Uh, we love to use this Zoom webinar platform to engage with you, our audience, uh, as we are still limited in how we can get together in person. Uh, one of the ways this works really well is through the question and answer session at the end of each program. If you have any questions for our wonderful speaker today, Jill Watts, you can put those questions into the Q&A section of the webinar. That looks like two speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what device you're using to join us today. If you are, um, if you are, uh, if you have any technical troubleshooting questions, you can put those into the chat section of the webinar feature. Uh, so again, any technical uh, difficulties you can put into the chat, any content questions for Dr. Watts can go into the Q&A section. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the President and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, to start today's program. Jane? Oh, get, trying to get my video on. Here, let me see if I can send you a prompt. Sorry about that. We're, uh, uh, you know, the miracles of modern technology. Uh, Jane got snowed in uh, yeah, okay. in an alternate location. Uh, and so here she is now to uh, start today's program. Jane? Well, see, yes, it is the miracles of modern technology. Uh, I got snowed in Chautauqua, New York, um, where I went for the long weekend. And so I'm, I'm here, uh, Jill's in California, and Sam's in Washington, D.C. Uh, so here we are, once again, welcoming you, you to the Capitol Historical Society's webinar series as we deal with public history. And we start the year commemorating and sharing the story of the incredible work of Mary McLeod Bethune. Why were we doing this? Because Coming soon to the Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol will be the statue of Mary McLeod Bethune. The first time that a state has chosen a, an African-American, uh, she is an African-American woman. She will be the first uh, person in the Statuary Hall collection to be in academic regalia. And so sometime in spring, when it's safe to gather, uh, she will come and there will be a proper, de de you know, proper celebration of her joining the Statuary Hall collection. As part of our commemoration of that, uh, we are doing a series of webinars and lectures about her work and the importance of her work. We will be doing a hybrid format uh, Bethune Symposium together with uh, good partners um, from, we've been working uh, in consultation with the National Council of Negro Women, the Roosevelt Institute, um, and we've been working in consultation with the Bethune-Cookman University. We also are developing educational resources um, to, and one of the things that is so amazing about the story about this statue is, the state of Florida voted that Mary McLeod Bethune should come to the Capitol, but unlike every other state before, they didn't choose to fund the statue. That did not stop determined Floridians. And so the determined Floridians created the Bethune Statuary Collection, uh, um, Commission, raised the money, and that is why we have this incredible statue. So stay tuned. Um, for our series. And we are very, very grateful that the series, the educational resources, and the engagement with this whole effort is going to be possible from a generous grant from Wells Fargo. And so we are very appreciative of Wells Fargo's support of the Bethune series. So the first of our Bethune series is an amazing speaker that we have today. Dr. Jill Watts is a professor 
of History at California State University, San Marcos, where she teaches United States social and cultural history, African-American history, film history, and digital history. Um, in addition to the book that she's going to talk about today, The Black Cabinet, The Untold Story of African-Americans in Politics During the Age of Roosevelt, she is also the author of Hattie McDaniel, Black Ambition, and White, Holly White Hollywood, Mae West, an icon in black and white, and God Harlem USA, The Father Divine Story. Both books on Hattie um, McDaniel and Father Divine have been optioned for films. So she writes in a way that absolutely engages people. She's consulted with two PBS documentaries and has talked on the radio nationally about African-American history, women's history, and film history. She was born in Los Angeles County, but raised in her father's hometown of San Diego um, and earned her BA from the University of California, San Diego, her MA and PhD in history from UCLA. She's had a distinguished career, including being involved at Cornell University. And in 2017, she was grateful to be selected as the Break Bill Distinguished Professor at California State University at St. Marcos. She served as the History's Depart History Department's Chair, the Coordinator of the History Graduate Program, the Program Director of Film Studies, and the Co-Director of Women's Studies. She helped establish the digital history component uh, for the history's graduate degree. All of this while writing books, teaching classes, and engaging in some of her other passions. Before she became a historian, she taught music and worked for the Park City Ski Resort. She believes passionately that knowing history is necessary, is practical, and especially in these times. And so we are so grateful that Professor Watts has given me permission to call her Jill during this conversation. So it is not out of disrespect for all of your earnings, but out of a friendship that we have developed, uh, albeit over Zoom. So Professor Watts, Tell us about the Black Cabinet. Who were they and what did Mary Bethune do about it? Oh, thank you so much for that introduction, Jane. I so appreciate it. And um, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, you and Sam and the Capitol, U.S. Capitol Historical Society for asking me to be a part of this series. And I'm so grateful and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. And also thanks to everybody who's tuning in on, on Zoom there. Um, grateful to uh, be able to share this history with you and a, a shout out especially uh, to Ranger John Fowler of the National Park Service. Um, Ranger Fowler oversees the Bethune um, Council House, which I'm going to talk about in just a little bit, and also the Frederick Douglass and Carter G. Woodson historic sites. So um, I, I just want to say uh, thanks to John for um, all of his support and all of his knowledge. So grateful. Um, let me start my PowerPoint here. Uh, I haven't done this since December, since the end of the semester, so I'll share my screen. So um, this, what I'm here to talk about is Mary McLeod Bethune and the era of Franklin Roosevelt. And um, I, I'm really um, excited to be a part of the speaker series, at, you know, at, as we anticipate the arrival of Dr. Bethune's statue, uh, which will be placed in Statuary Hall there in, on Capitol Hill. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start out with an introduction. I'm going to talk about what the Black Cabinet was. My work focuses on, on this era of her life when she's involved in the Roosevelt administration and the Black Cabinet. I'm so my dog is back there. <laughs> she knows the talk is starting, so she's, she's checking out for a nap right now. <laughs> Hopefully you aren't. So, um, so I'm going to talk about the Black Cabinet and introduce you to it in general. And then I'm going to talk about kind of the issue of space and memory and, and inclusion. Then um, what I did was I picked three, three spaces, three other spaces 
within <laughs> Washington, D.C. So it should say place one with the T Street house that uh, was her home and the headquarters for the National Council of Negro Women. The White House is my second space. And the third space is the council house that I just mentioned. So it's at three spaces. <laughs> so, so I'm going to um, kind of weave uh, her story through these physical spaces. And for those of you who are in Washington, D.C., you can um, go visit these spaces. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not open to the public right now, as I understand, but um, it gives you a sense of how, um, how important um, space and place is to history and, and in thinking about historical accomplishments. So I'm going to leave my PowerPoint like this because whenever I do the, the run slideshow, um, this, the, the sensor is so sensitive, I, I go through my slides like all at once and then students are like, oh, class is over. <laughs> it's just because the slideshow runs itself. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run it this way. It's the most efficient way for me. Um, like I said, my work focuses on Dr. Bethune's years um, as a federal official during the era of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And my book um, talks about overall the Black cabinet, which she becomes a part of in 1936. And as many of you know, Dr. Bethune had a wide and very public career as an educational leader and also as a leader in the Black Women's Club movement. Um, and other people I'm sure will zoom in and talk to you and, and enrich your background on those, those aspects of her life. So I really encourage you to follow the series. Um, the Black Cabinet, however, and here's a picture of the Black Cabinet in 1938, and you can see um, Dr. Bethune here, right, right in the middle. And she's, she's critical to the Black Cabinet. Black Cabinet was an unofficial and unsanctioned group. It was not, um, as many people say, FDR's Black Cabinet. In fact, when he was approached about having a Black Cabinet, he turned down that possibility and he, he denied the opportunity for the Black federal employees who were coming into the administration to organize something as a formal advisory group to the president um, and that would have direct access to the president. No, indeed, the Black Cabinet organized itself and it was self-organized and self-directed. And it was thanks to a great degree to Mary McLeod Bethune's genius as an organizer that this group came together as a whole and were able to take what they were doing separately to the next degree. Um, the thing about Mrs. Bethune was, and, and you can keep this in mind as I talk, nobody ever said no to her, okay? So, so the Black Cabinet, it actually begins to form in the FDR administration in the later part of 1933. When FDR takes office in March 1933, in those days the president took the oath of office in March, right away he jump-started the New Deal, which was his program to solve the American Depression and get America back on its feet again. Well, it was really clear right away that the New Deal was a program designed by white Americans to get white Americans out of the Great Depression and that the black community and other communities as well were being completely bypassed by the New Deal programs. By the summer of 1933, the alarm is sounding within the black community amongst black leaders and members of the black community because the black community is sinking deeper and deeper into the depression and the New Deal programs are clearly not only not addressing the needs of black people, but they're actually making it worse. They're establishing, for instance, wage differentials that the federal government is actually okaying. Um, on the top of it, FDR is being pressured to bring African-American advisors into the black cabinet. He had a very important um, um, African-American newspaper publisher, Robert Fan, who defected from the Republican party and supported him. And there was a, a great feeling that FDR owed the black community um, these positions as, as an acknowledgement of their support for his presidency in 1932. By no means make the mistake, however, most African-Americans in 1932 voted for Hoover. They voted for the party of Lincoln and they voted for the Republicans. Robert Van, however, led a significant group of voters out of the Republican Party into the Democratic Party and gave the Democrats this hope that possibly they might be able to capture the Black vote. So there was pressure on FDR to appoint advisors. 
and the pressure remained throughout. He begins to do this in the summer of 1933, and it's very slow. And so you'll find the ranks of different cabinet departments and different New Deal programs being populated by the people that you see here on the screen. Um, probably the most significant early addition next to Robert Van, who won a position in the Justice Department, is Robert Weaver here, who is uh, standing here on this side. Robert Weaver is hired into the Department of Interior, and he becomes a real mover and shaker in, in terms of um, um, getting Black jobs programs off the ground almost right away. But the cabinet runs into a lot of barriers, and they will continue to run into barriers. So I, I'll leave the story there. You kind of think of this, and it's primarily young men, older men, um, some leaders of, of, of civil rights organizations, uh, Eugene Kunkel Jones from the Urban League. Um, they're, they're separated throughout different agencies. They are divided by generation, by education, their personal differences, and also their agencies compete for resources. So I'll leave the story there for a moment, okay, and let you think about that. Let me go back here to this slide here where we see the statue of a Mary McLeod Bethune. And I just want to kind of talk a little bit about this statue and its pending arrival. Um, Mary McLeod Bethune was a first in so many different ways. First woman to um, organize HBCU, historically black college university, um, and, and the only to this date. Um, the first African-American woman appointed to oversee a federal program by FDR in 1936. Um, so she's, she's a, a, a first of many, she will become with the placement of this statue, the first African-American to represent a state in Statuary Hall. And significantly, she replaces the statue of a Confederate soldier. So the statue is more than just a commemoration. It's an extension of her activism, an extension of her political presence that she established during this black cabinet period. If you think about it, in the period of time in which she came to Washington, D.C. African-Americans are silenced from the political realm by lack of representation and lack of voting rights. And these are two things very much on her agenda as she arrives in Washington, D.C. African-Americans are erased from public space by Jim Crow segregation and discrimination. And this is very much true in Washington, D.C. Um, her determination was to be heard and establish a recognized presence within the nation's capital, which served as an example for the rest of the nation. Um, so her presence in the hall reclaims a public space and is part of that continuing struggle for inclusion and voice that she fought so hard for. And for not just herself, but for um, African-American people to have. So I'll kind of leave you with those thoughts. And just to say now, you can probably see, what I tried to do is organize this talk around the places and spaces that she was present and that she occupied. And that's why I picked these three places, which should be one, two, and three, but they're all numbered three. Okay. So here's um, our landmark number one, our, our, our place number one. This is the first um, residence of Mary McLeod Bethune in Washington, D.C. It's the, and also the first headquarters of the National Council of Negro Women that she established in 1935 as an umbrella organization for women's clubs. And she was very determined to have this presence in Washington, D.C., even before um, she became involved in the FDR administration. The idea was to establish a foothold for Black women in, in Washington, D.C., and to establish their political voice there with that presence. So, but let me um, for a moment have you kind of just imagine as you look at the this space here, um, it's a modest, a modest home here. I've lost my mouse there. There it is. So here, here's the space that we're talking about. Um, in August of 1936, the core members of the Black Cabinet 
um, these were all men who held positions in these New Deal programs, and they had been contentious. They weren't exactly moving forward together. They, they were recognized as a Black cabinet by Black journalists. Black journalists identified them as a Black cabinet, and people were celebrating this inclusion of Black voices. But as, as a unified force, they weren't operating in that way at all. They you know, were breaking off and working individually, or sometimes working together in cliques. And Robert Weaver had his very famous uh, poker parties on Saturday night in his basement, and he invited select um, cabinet members. And these were people who he'd attended Harvard with and um, had grown up with, sort of the kind of Ivy League contingent of the Black cabinet. So she sent out a, a, an, an invitation to these men. And basically, it was really a summons. <laughs> when Mrs. Bethune called, you came. Um, on August 7th, she said, you will come to my house Friday evening after work, and we will have a meeting. And so that Friday evening on August 7th, 1936, um, these young men, you can imagine them arriving and, and, and traveling up the stairs and gathering together in her living room. Okay, now by this point, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune had taken the reins of the Black Division of the National Youth Administration. She had been an advisor for over a year to the FDR administration on a community board for the National Youth Administration, which was a program to get relief and training and uplift to young people. And she was very vocal in advocating for a separate division dedicated to making sure that those resources got to young Black people. So it wasn't formalized until May of 1936. And probably you can think about this because it's, it's correlating with an election year. FDR is going to run for um for his second term and there is very much uh, a thought about um collecting black votes so at this point in her life mary mcleod bethune is regarded as one of the great leaders of the african-american community in fact she's called the first lady of black america and in fact she's been identified by a, a white journalist ida Arda, ida tarbell as one of the 50 most 15 most influential women in all of the country, okay? So she is incorporated into the New Deal administration as an official, that's pathbreaking, okay? Like I said before, it's the first African-American woman to take the reins of a federal program. So by August, she's decided she's going to call the black cabinet members together. How she was able to, um, con to rise uh, so, so quickly within the FDR administration, well, it's because she shares a friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt. It's really more an acquaintance in 1935, and it becomes a friendship in 1936 after she becomes more presence within Washington, D.C. Now, the one thing is that, and, and Eleanor Roosevelt advocates for her and her programs, and so she's a really key piece of this story. The one thing that the Black Cabinet all agrees on, everyone knows, is, is that the stakes are high. For the African-American community, um, they need relief and they need it now. Everyone knows in the Black cabinet that Black people suffered disproportionately more during the Great Depression and that the situation was grim for all Americans, but extraordinarily dire for Black Americans. Homelessness was not uncommon. Unemployment ran twice that of, of the white communities in America in many places. Starvation in rural areas was not uncommon. Starvation, malnutrition, um, lack of access to education had always been a problem for the Black community. The Black community had been in a depression throughout its history. And when the crisis hit in America, it only drove a community that was languishing in poverty into even more and more desperate circumstances. Something had to be done to save Black America. And like I said, the New Deal was bypassing Black Americans. Everyone knew that there was something that had to happen and it had to happen quickly. And by 1936, you've had three years of the New Deal and Black Americans are, are not climbing out of the situation. If you look at the great photographs taken by the Great Depression photographers, the New Deal photographers, you see it bear witness to the kind of desperation that Black families were feeling. 
So when Mrs. Methuen called, people came. And like I said, you can imagine the men gathering together in her living room there. Now, in this evening, what she does is she decides that it's time to rally the Black cabinet, that the, the divisions are hurting the community. And let me read to you what she says. And I've got my eye on the clock here. Um, let us stand together and work together as one big brotherhood and give momentum to the great ball that is starting to roll for Negroes. The exceptional things have been done for white people. Let's get some exceptional things done for Negroes. The people of the white race are ignorant as to what is being done by and for Negroes. And what she's talking about is that, that white Americans have no idea what's going on and they need to be, as she says, enlightened. I feel helpless without the fellowship, interest, and cooperation of you all. We must think in terms of strategic attacks at this time. Let us forget the particular office of each particular office each one of us holds and think how we might in a cooperative way get over to the masses the things that are being done and the things that need to be done. We must think in terms of a whole for the greatest service to our people. Now I'm nowhere near as uh, charismatic as Dr. Bethune was. You know, people, she could hold a whole crowd spellbound. But she demands that the group get together and they share information across their programs and strategize across the programs and advocate together, stronger as a whole than as individuals. And that strategy was a strategy that she had employed as an educator and as a women's club leader. And now she brought it to Washington, DC. And as I said, no one, and black cabinet members would testify to this later, no one would ever say no to Mrs. Bethune as she, as she was called respectfully then. So that night, that group that often fought very bitterly and would continue to fight, they left with a sense, with a sense that they had received a mandate to unite by one of the most important figures in Black America. And what you find is that the Black Cabinet will see its most active and organized years afterwards with Miriam Cloud Bethune at the helm. And she shared that leadership strategically very smart. She shared that leadership with the young, I'm Robert Weaver. Let me just say briefly who Mary McLeod Bethune was. She was born in Maysville, South Carolina in 1875. Her parents were formerly enslaved and after slave times, they became sharecroppers, eventually able to buy their own land, but always perpetually struggling because even though they owned their own land, they were perpetually indebted in order to try to keep the farm running. You see here a photograph of the McLeod cabin and some relatives of Mary McLeod Bethune, according to the photograph, standing in front of the cabin much later. Um, education became her path out. She attended a local church school and then later Scotia Cemetery, which was called the Mount Holyoke of the South. Um, and, and she did so in a scholarship. And finally, at, she attended Bi Moody Bible Institute. After she left Moody Bible Institute, she dedicated her career to opening the doors of education for Black youth. And many of you know the story. She's the founder of the Bethune-Cookman University, as it's called now, Cookman College, which she opened out of her home as a grade school for young, young, ch young children, young Black girls. It was a girls' school. And eventually, she transformed it into a full-fledged college campus. You see here, early on when it, with her with one of her classes of, of, of black girls as she's, you see the little ones here up in the front. And then um, um, here's the Faith Hall, which was one of the first buildings on Bethune-Cookman University's campus. She's also noted for the founding of the National Council of Negro Women, who is, is really um, much the steam behind um, keeping, Dr. Bethune's memory alive and her history uh, going in our present time. So here you see a, a photograph again from 1938 of one of the meetings in Washington, DC. And as I said, she saw the women's club movement as significant to black women, not just as a social or um, I'm doing good works uplift group, but these, these, these groups she believed could be mobilized politically, that she could mobilize black women in areas where they could vote to vote, to have a, a political voice. And that is why she locates her headquarters in Washington, DC. Mary McLeod Bethune viewed that 
full, viewed full political participation as a path to black liberation in America. And that's why her involvement in the government is so important and so significant and her presence within Washington DC so meaningful. So my second landmark, my second place is the White House. So here you see um, uh, the White House in the 1930s and then over here you see uh, FDR in his private office in the White House. And you can kind of imagine, because of her relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt, Mary McLeod Bethune had access that none of it, nobody else in the Black Cabinet had. They couldn't get to the White House at all, their, their needs, their, their demands, um, what the Black community um, desired. They couldn't get to the White House. They were shut out. And not only, I mean, FDR's Oval Office staff was white Southerners. Um, black cabinet members often couldn't even get to the heads of their divisions and their programs. When they first came into Washington, DC, they were received really hostily. Some of them segregated from the rest of their colleagues in their division, um, forced to work in what literally broom closets or in the hall. Um, and Mary McLeod Bethune, that was a different case when she arrived. Um, and, and people like Robert Weaver had been challenging the segregation in the Washington DC workplace. Um, um, the, the, the DC cafeterias discriminated against black federal workers and Robert Weaver with one of his colleagues challenged that and, and demanded to be served. And he was backed up by his department head, which who was Harold Ickes, the head of the Department of the Interior. So that had been going on and that will continue to go on. But the White House was really where a lot of the Black Cabinet members believed if they could get to FDR and, and get him to hear what Black America needed, that there would be more response. So you can imagine as you look in this space, the White House is a White House. Very few Black Americans entered those doors, very few Black Americans, unless they were going to work as, in, as part of the domestic staff. There were a few um, leaders like Walter White, but again, he was the leader of the NAACP and his access came through, through Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, you can imagine Mary McLeod Bethune used that relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt and people remembered Eleanor Roosevelt um, coming down the driveway when Mary McLeod Bethune was at the gate in order to greet her and then take her by the arm and escort her into the White House past the, the, the hostility that Mary McLeod Bethune would feel from the, the White House um, office staff and the white workers in the White House. In fact, Bethune told an amazing story of when she first visited the White House, which was actually under the Herbert Hoover administration for a conference, and she often told this story uh, she, as she was walking up the White House lawn to attend the conference. I think she was entering the East Wing. One of the white groundsmen called out to her, hey, where do you think you're going, auntie? And um, as she told the story, she turned around and marched right over to the groundsman and looked at him and said, um, I don't recognize you. Which one of my sister's children are you? and then turned around and walked right into the White House. She, th this, this is a story she told, but we have evidence that Dr. Bethune was utterly and completely courageous and didn't, didn't mince words. So you can imagine her there in FDR's private office where she was received. She was not allowed to put official appointments on the books. FDR was always concerned about alienating the white Southern contingent of the Democratic Party that he relied on for votes and who um, lived in the heavily segregated South. Um, so you can imagine her in, her in his office bringing to FDR the needs of the Black cabinet members, which she was collecting now that they were working as a collective, um, as a collective group. So just to remind you again, there are the members of the Black cabinet. And this exclusion that I'm talking about is what all Black cabinet members were trying to address. Again, when they went to work in these federal offices, some federal offices, the toilets were segregated. You couldn't take the elevator. You were forced to take the freight elevator or the stairs. Um, so, so their presence just within the confines of the nation's capital, they're fighting for inclusion within space, okay? But like I said, there was a long way to go. Um, 
let's talk a little bit about the Black Cabinet's accomplishments, because I know I'm going to run out of time, and I think some of you probably have to go back to work at, at one o'clock, for those of you on the East Coast. Um, essentially, what happens is, is that the Black Cabinet's able to create a new deal for Black Americans. You know, we talk about um, John Collier and the Indian New Deal. Well, in many ways, there was a Black New Deal. And like I said, Robert Weaver and his colleagues had been fighting for equal treatment, not only within the federal workplace, but also equal um, access to New Deal programs for Black people. And they had won important victories um, before Bethune's edition, but with Bethune's edition, it accelerates. There's more attention brought to um, the needs of Black people, more funds coming through. And that's because she's able to, to um, breach the White House's um, racial barriers through that friendship. But if you want to look at the kind of accomplishments in the interior department where Robert Weaver was located, you have the inclusion of the first anti-discrimination clauses at the federal level in contracts and also a, a mechanism by which you can enforce those clauses. It's one thing to say you can't discriminate, but it's a whole other thing to have a mechanism to say that not only you can't discriminate, we're going to oversee you and make sure and there will be a penalty if you do. Um, getting jobs programs started for Black Americans. Um, well, actually, I may stay on this because this is a great example of public housing. This is a public housing development and a playground where you see children playing. And that was on the agenda for um, Robert Weaver and something um, Mary McLeod Bethune very strongly supported. Um, rural education, I mean, I'm sorry, um, um, education relief in northern cities. Here you have one of um, Mary McLeod's uh, Bethune's um, nurseries, and Eleanor Roosevelt is visiting it, and you can see the children in a, in a preschool. Um, this was a, something that she worked on with the WPA and another Black Cabinet member. Here you have in Mississippi young women uh, working in a library. And so the idea was is to get New Deal relief to get um, jobs and training and education to the Black community. Um, there's rural education and relief too um, that comes out of the New Deal program. Again, a rural schoolhouse built and then uh, a teacher hired and children studying. And then um, Black farmers who received, this is part of a collective farm um, that Black farmers were incorporated into in Georgia, receiving the, the, the assistance that they need in order to get back on their feet. Um, the Black presence in the federal government, as I, I said, that was important too. Growing the ranks of Black federal officials and staff, um, creating those voices within the government, you know, that would broaden the New Deal programs successfully, but I have to say it was never enough to address all the, um, the needs of the Black community. And here you see pictured Robert Weaver with one of his secretaries um, working on New Deal, New Deal um, issues. The thing about the, the, the presence of the Black cabinet and the, um, the utter and absolute energy of Mary McLeod Bethune, Eleanor Roosevelt said later on that the New Deal was basically an economic relief program to get the depression solved. But it's reimagined during the time it was implemented, okay? And for Mary McLeod Bethune and other Black cabinet members, this was a major opportunity for America to turn and, and take a new path. FDR talked a lot about there would be no forgotten Americans and that the federal government had a responsibility. But the Black cabinet members reminded the federal government that the federal government had a moral and constitutional responsibility, not just to safeguard Americans in economic crisis, but to safeguard their civil rights, their constitutional rights that, that were not just economic, but they were political and they were social. They were civil rights, they were human rights, they were social justice. To that end, one of the other accomplishments of the Black Cabinet and Mary McLeod Bethune. After she takes the reins, they're able to convince um, the Roosevelt administration to sponsor two White House conferences to study the problems that Black Americans encounter and develop solutions. Um, and these two conferences here, you see this is from the Pittsburgh Courier, which is a report in the paper about 
um, one of the conferences. And here you see important recommendations will be submitted to Roosevelt. So they can get directly to Roosevelt. And as I said, does it ever reach the level that Black Americans need? No. Okay. But it does document for the first time at a federal level what's going on in, in Black America and the kind of racism that Black Americans face. And Roosevelt might not act, but at least it's out there finally. And this provides this groundwork for the later civil rights movement and for legislation that you'll find coming in the 1960s. And that includes the Voting Rights Act. In these conferences, what's unveiled is the mass discrimination and disenfranchisement of Black voters. And Mary McLeod Bethune and others are very um, forceful on this issue as long as you as long as you disenfranchise a portion of your population, you'll never achieve the constitutional promise in America that is held out. Here's my um, third landmark, the Council House, which um, again, putting in a, um, a word for John Fowler and the Council House. Council House is closed right now, but here's a link to the Council House so if you can copy it down, but you can look up um, the, the count, Mary McLeod Bethune Council House. Um, and that takes me to the end here. I know I'm going to run out of time to the war years. Um, what happened to the Black cabinet? Um, during the war years, the council, you'll see, moves and has a much larger house. So as the council is expanding its presence, um, at the same time, Mary McLeod Bethune and other Black cabinet members are fighting to continue on with the, the, the New Deal programs that are providing Black Americans with such desperately needed relief. But the war years bring about a shift in funding and Congress begins cutting New Deal programs. And, you know, as you will not be surprised, the first programs to go are the programs that address the needs of Black people. And as those programs collapse, Black cabinet members begin losing their jobs. But then switches gears and begins advocating to redirect her programs, the money coming to the National Youth Administration, into training um, young people for defense jobs, which are going to be needed as the war, you know, as the war intensifies. So um, she begins shifting and arguing that you don't want to collapse these programs because you need to train all young people in, in, you know, in defense. And then also she begins with other Black cabinet members advocating for um, equal treatment within the American military. Um, she's very instrumental in um, Actually, she starts talking about Black Air Corps in the late 1930s. So she's envisioning what happens in Tuskegee, you know, years before. And then here you have her with one of her uh, assistants from the council office, um, Debbie Johnson Roundtree, who um, she directs to join the WACs. And she's instrumental in getting African-American women included in the women's um, division of the military. And also in this case, um, Debbie Johnson Roundtree attended the um, officer's training camp in uh, Iowa. So they integrated the officer's training camp, black women integrated that officer's training camp in Iowa. And that was a, a difficult, um, difficult uh, story. You can read about it in her biography, auto, in her autobiography, Debbie Johnson Roundtree. Um, so by 1934, 43, as they relocate, as, the, as they relocate to the council house, where's the council house? Um, Mary McClellan Bethune finds that uh, she is also out of a job about the middle of the year. And um, she tries to continue to find ways back into government service through Eleanor Roosevelt, but never able to find a position where she could have that kind of influence that she felt that she needed in order to make change. And in the end, you know, she would be um, included in the founding delegation to the United Nations and she would advise Truman, but she would work from the outside, pressuring the government from the outside. So as I'm wrapping this up, <laughs> I'm sorry if this went long. Um, the statue here, as you see um, where it's displayed in, in Daytona Beach. And now I, I believe it's in her hometown of Maysville, South Carolina, or in that area on display. Um, it represents a return of Mary McLeod Bethune to Washington, DC. It, it's almost part of the triumph in her 
in, in, in her many triumphs. Um, and, you know, she, at the end of her life, would say she hadn't achieved enough. And that, that she would even, if she was here now, tell us there's still so much more work to be done. But it represents a victory in terms of having her voice heard in Washington, D.C., and having us think about um, the Capitol as an inclusive space. And I wanted to end with this um, quote from her. Um, in the 30s, while she was in the Black Cabinet, she was invited to a White House reception by Eleanor Roosevelt. It was a tea at the White House. And um, when she entered, she would, she would have seen the table, which was laid out with all, you know, the, the best of that the White House could offer, um, sandwiches and, and, and desserts and, you know, yummy candies. And so she enters and, you know, the glitter, glitter of the White House. And she talks about that she can't forget the people that are out there suffering. And she can't forget what her, what her mission is, what her calling is. And this is what she says. And I, I think about this in relationship to the statue. Um, in all that great group, and it was a group of women associated with the New Deal, I felt a sense of being quite alone. So while I sip the tea in the brilliance of the White House, my heart reaches out to the Delta land and the bottom land. And I know why I must be here and must go to tea at the White House to remind them always that we belong here. We are a part of America. So I'll leave that thought with you. And um, I'm glad to have a discussion with you now. I'll stop sharing the screen. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I tried to tell you. You did a great job. You <laughs> did a fabulous job. And I think people were completely enamored with the entire conversation. So oh. let, me, let me just ask you a couple quick questions. One, I think you can answer just almost right straight off the bat. Um, who was the black member uh, at the Department of Justice and what was his job? Okay, so yeah, it, well, there were a couple, but the, the first one was Robert Van, a publisher of the Pittsburgh Courier. He was also an, a, an attorney and uh, a very high up in the Republican Party in terms of black representation, but he defected to support Roosevelt and he received an appointment in the Justice Department in the summer of 1933. Now, Van had hoped he was going to be working on things like civil rights cases, but what he found himself is kind of shuttled off to push papers. And I think he worked a lot on um, like property disputes and um, property claims. So um, Robert Van. Okay. And now, do you have any information? There's been some conversation about Mrs. Bethune and there was a Woolworths across the street from the Capitol Arena, and there was some consideration at the Hotel Monaco about how welcome she was. Do you know about um, that? You know, I vaguely have heard about that, but I I don't know a lot. She 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 often tried to integrate spaces and a lot of different spaces within the Capitol, and um, it'll give you a sense of how segregated the Capitol was. Um, black people were often, often not welcome in businesses throughout. Um, I do know that she participated heavily in picketing um, people's drug in, in located in um, the black community because it would not um, hire, you know, black employees. And so she was very much a part of that. So it wouldn't surprise me that, um, but I, I, you know, that's a good question. I'll, I'll write it down because I need to know more about that. <laughs> And tell us about the National Council of Negro Women. Uh, you mentioned that she organized that organization. And tell us about the mission of the NCN, NCNW. So her idea was it would serve as this umbrella organization for all Black women's organizations across the country. You know, there were Black women's clubs in America dating back to the 19th century. and um, there was a, a larger umbrella organization that preceded this, and she was the president of that as well. And um, its headquarters she had located in Washington, D.C. But um, what she wanted was something grander and larger than, than the organizations of just women's clubs. She wanted to bring 
you know, women's church groups and the sororities and bring everybody together. And the mission was to, to, to have Black women communicating across the board, again, uh, organizing to gather forward to make change. So there is a little, there's tension because local Black women's clubs have their own agendas and have needs within their own communities that, that had to be addressed. But Bethune thought that there needed to be more uniformity and more cooperation. And especially, I believe, in Bethune's mind, the idea was just to incorporate Black women into every aspect of American life, um, into higher education, into K through 12, in, in, you know, into other organizations. And only as mar marching forward together as one could that be done. And especially, though, I think what she thought was is that this would be a place where Black women could commence um, seeking access to political, political power and with their voices be able to redirect America. So I, I think the women's clubs, like I said, there were local agendas and then she had a broader national vision for them. I hope that answers the question. Oh, absolutely. Now, I want you to tell me a little bit about, I noticed in the picture and in the book that she was often the only woman in the black cabinet and in those meetings. Nevertheless, she was the one running the meetings. How did that work out? Um, well, it's a little bit, <laughs> the men were, uh, I think, sometimes a little bit taken aback, but she was who she was, and she had a lot of clout coming into Washington, D.C. And also, on the last question, let me mention, I believe you're having the National Council of Negro Women speaking in some part of this series, and that's a great question to ask them about their history. So, um so as they continue on today, um, um, moving forward. Uh, but yeah, uh, the thing about Bethune is um, sh she's just completely courageous and brave. And um, when she comes into a space, she demands to be recognized, to occupy it. And I think that that's really important as you think about the statue coming too. But these are young, most of them young men, and many of them trained in the methods of social sciences. Um, Robert Weaver had a PhD in economics from Harvard. Um, um, there were people who had law degrees from Harvard and other Ivy Leagues. And their problem was they weren't dynamic in terms of being able to translate all the data that they'd been gathering showing the, that, that the New Deal was actually hurting Black Americans, but there was a solution. And what she talked about is you have to dramatize this for people and you have to get the word out because if people find out they're gonna be horrified and they're gonna support the New Deal and they're gonna support um, um, African-Americans receiving relief. And um, I think that there was a feeling amongst both the younger and the older generation that Bethune sometimes had stepped out of what was her proper role as a woman, that she was, you know, as, as we even talk about today, she was bossy. Well, if a man um, is, um, aggressive in terms of stating the case, they're praised for it and women are not. And, and so she, she came up against that. And I think um, she just refused to hear that and refused to succumb to any kind of attempt to marginalize her. So, so yeah. <laughs> and, I, you know, she was happy to be co-leader with Weaver, but um, I think that very much um, was very happy to tell Weaver what he had to do. Now, she will listen though. There are times when she decides that she wants to do something, but, uh, and, and the rest of the group says, no, I don't think that's a good idea. And um, it takes a little bit, but she'll listen. Um, there was a March on Washington planned by A. Philip Randolph, who was not in the black cabinet, but very famous black labor leader. And the idea was just to get Roosevelt to stop discrimination within the military and stop discrimination within the um, defense industry. And at first she doesn't support it, but she eventually comes around and supports it after she's convinced that, that it, it's going to work. It's going to be a way that you can leverage some change within the administration, so. Well, and I think we have one final question uh, from our audience. Uh, who was Richard Lieber? Um, I honestly, I have to say, I don't know. Oh, Richard Lieber? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what, you, you must have. Uh, Maybe I misspoke yeah. or something. Gabriella, um, 
Kui asked the question. Uh, if you want to type in something about yeah, some, let us more know about why you're asking that question, um, is, we is will. It, it uh, we'll do some we'll do some follow up and try to figure out the answer because we don't know the answer. And one of the things we've learned in these every time we do these uh, webinars, there's something new that our audience asks that people mm -hmm. need to learn, and that's that's why we're doing it. Uh, you know, it's the the story of history is always uh, revealed um, and it's revealed through the analysis uh, of what's going on. And that really is something that we have to be attentive to and that's why the society exists. So I want to, you know, as, as, we, as we wrap, um, to remind people a couple things, um, you know, this is always what we call our NPR moment. Um, the United States Capitol Historical Society exists because of the donations of our friends and supporters. And so thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, if you share the invitation to participate with friends and neighbors, that's one of the ways we get the word out. And so I wanna to talk to you about some of the things that are upcoming um, as we move forward. Um, and that is, that this, what we call our Bethune series is gonna be continuing throughout spring of 2022. Um, as Jill told you, we're gonna be having John Fowler, who is from the National Park Service, talk to us about the council house, at the Bethune house, what, what it was like, what it how it's been preserved and how that story will continue to be told once it's reopened again. Um, we also are continuing to work with our uh, partners uh, that are from the National Council of Negro Women. The Ele you heard the, the reference to Eleanor Roosevelt and the role that she played. And so we've been working with the, Ellen, uh, the Roosevelt Institute uh, that is a part, uh, so part of the Roosevelt Library, uh, their, their sort of educational partner. So we'll be talking about the role that Eleanor Roosevelt played in that effort. And we are working on developing uh, curriculum for students as part of our overall effort at civic education. And we hope that we can even do some fun things. There is already outdoors at, in Lincoln Park, there's an outdoor statue of Mary McLeod Bethune. And we hope to do something where we can gather neighborhood students to tell the story while we're waiting for the statue to come into Statuary Hall. As we talk about kids, we wanna remind you or alert you, this is not a reminder, this is actually new news is, uh, our civic education uh, leader has decided to start a capital kids program where we will have programming that is focused for, for students, uh, families, teachers, children, uh, where there are children's books that are set in the capital that tell the story of the Capitol and the Constitution. And so the first one is gonna be Kitty Feldy talking about her new book about uh, a young woman who goes to the State of the Union and the adventures that happen there. So we'll be doing that uh, at the end of February as we come upon the State of the Union. In April, uh, we will be celebrating Ulysses Grant, um, his 200th birthday. And in cooperation with uh, critical members of Congress, we're gonna be commemorating his life with a symposium where we once again look at how he worked with Congress on reconstruction and trying to rebuild our nation in the wake of the Civil War. It is also the 200th anniversary of the birth of Frederick Law Olmsted, the father of landscape architecture, and that his birthday's in April, but we're planning a symposium in the fall uh, together with Olmsted 200, uh, where we really talk about his work and how it has influenced uh, not just his work, but the work of his son has influenced the grounds of the Capitol itself. And this May, is the 100th anniversary of the Lincoln Memorial, uh, which was authorized by Congress and built, uh, opened uh, 
in May, 100 years ago. And so we're gonna be working together with the Lincoln uh, Memorial uh, Festivity uh, to do some symposiums about how that memorial came to be and the work of Abraham Lincoln. So you can see there are several programs uh, coming along. This program is available through our website. Um, you can go back and look at it if you uh, wanna share it with friends. Uh, the video is always gonna be there. Uh, again, if you are interested, make sure you sign up for our newsletter so you'll be aware of all the things that are coming forth. Professor Watts, thank you for taking the time to be with us uh, to tell this story. We really appreciate having your guidance here. And Sam, thank you for your work as Director of Operations and Scholarship that I get to stand up here and say things, but the fact that we have a good program and that it's all connected is really a result of your efforts. So thank you very much, Sam, and all the behind the scenes people who work. They thank you to all our members. Be well, have a good day, stay warm. Thank you, everybody.